Brothers, brothers and sisters, what a joy it has been to sing together the truth, to sing together the praises of our God. Yeah. I come this morning bringing greetings from the 73 sister churches of the Colbert Lauderdale Baptist Association. Uh, I'm thankful for each one of those churches. I'm thankful for Underwood Baptist Church. And I'm thankful that our churches have recognized that the mission of the kingdom of God is too large to accomplish or even to attempt alone. So we work together, encourage one another along the way. We help one another along the way. But ultimately, together, we exalt our Lord and our Savior, who has done great things for us. Amen. Just really quickly want to invite you on October the 20th, our churches are going to gather together at Earl Trent Assembly for two purposes. We're going to celebrate the 50th anniversary of that camp where so many have come to Christ, including myself. So many have had their lives impacted by Christ, including myself. We're also going to have our annual meeting that night. And I'll give you, I don't, I don't say this everywhere I go, but it needs to be said here. We're going to end the night in a special way with a campfire, right? You end the night at Earl Trent with a campfire, and it's going to be led that night by, by Brother Larry Wright. And I personally cannot wait for that time. So I hope you'll join us October 20th. Put that on your calendars. Come out to Earl Trent. See what the Lord is doing out at the camp that we share. I'm really thankful this morning to be back with you. I will, I will confess I was relieved when Brother Larry reached out to me um, that I was being invited back after last time when I played Floyd Kramer and Glenn Miller as part of the message. So I was really thankful that, that I had not, uh, you know, eliminated myself from consideration by doing that. It's an honor to be with you truly, and that honor was compounded that Brother Larry was the one calling and inviting me. Uh, Brother Larry baptized me. He was my pastor growing up, and it meant so much to me that he trusted me for this moment, and it means so much to me that you trust me to be here as we open God's Word together today. Brother Larry has asked me today to, to, uh, to speak on how fatherhood has impacted my faith. Our fatherhood has impacted my faith. And we're going to get to that. But before we do, I want to acknowledge that today being Father's Day, it may be a difficult day. D days like this always come with a bit of mixed emotions. And in a room this size, there are some who've been dreading this day, just as there are some who are celebrating this day. And I just want to briefly say this. The goodness of God far exceeds the ways we, re we fail to reflect that goodness. In other words, God's goodness to us is not diminished by our cruelty to each other. I had a wonderful father. I'm thankful for him. I know the Lord because he put me in a position to know the Lord. But I know for others, their father was not there for them. Or maybe he was there and, and hurt them. And to the, if that's you in this room, I want you to know that the, the fact that your father failed you does not mean that your heavenly father fails you. In fact, God is not diminished by that failure. For others in this room, your father has already gone to be with the Lord, perhaps, and you're separated by death. But once again, there's good news because God's goodness is not diminished by the effects of our sin being death. And we know that just as Christ was resurrected, we too will be resurrected. For others in this room, you may long to be a father, and that just hasn't happened yet. And I know that that is a feeling of isolation. You feel like no one sees you. But I want you to hear me clearly that our God sees you. He hears you. He knows you. And he's with you. His presence is with you at all times. So whatever this day brings up for you regarding your earthly father, we come together to worship the perfect heavenly father who never changes, never fails, and never turns his back on us. This morning as we talk about fatherhood, I'd like to use Jude, the book of, tiny little book of Jude, to frame this discussion. The last two verses, verses 24 and 25. And as you turn there, I want to introduce you to my family. Because I'm going to be talking about them a lot, so I figured you might as well see them, right? My, my wife and my youngest four kids will, will be here for the second service. They went to Sunday school at our church. This is my crew, okay? This, this was Easter Sunday. On, on the, uh, the left side there, the tall guy, that's my oldest son, Maddox. He's 13, going into the seventh grade at Mars Hill. Okay, standing next to him is my daughter, Sophie. She's five years old. I'm holding Theo. Theo's four. My wife is holding 
our, our son Sam's hand. He's two years old, and, uh, and he is, uh, we call him Samity Calamity, right? Uh, she's holding our youngest, whose name is Jude, appropriately enough. He's uh, not quite four months old yet, almost there. And this is my beautiful wife, Maggie B. As I said, she'll be with us in the second service and is excited to, to worship together. I wanted you to have some faces to put with the stories that I may or may not tell in, during this particular sermon. The question was, how has fatherhood impacted my faith? And the question is, is that it has changed everything. In fatherhood, I've experienced joy that is deeper than I had ever encountered before. But likewise, I've experienced deep, deep suffering and pain. I've become acutely aware of my own shortcomings and flaws as I've parented little people and not so little people. But in every experience, I've found God to be faithful, and that is what we get to hold up as truth this morning. Let's look at God's Word together. Jude 24 and 25, I'm reading this morning from the English Standard Version. Now to Him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of His glory with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray together. Our Father, you told us that if anyone lacks wisdom, he should ask God who gives generously to all without a reproach. We ask now as we study your word that you might generously grant us wisdom to rightly hear and digest the truth. You told us that your word does not return empty, but that it accomplishes its purpose. We ask now that your word accomplish its purpose in us as we study it together. You told us that the seed that landed on good ground produced grain, some a hundredfold, some 60, some 30. We ask now that you make us good ground and that the seed of your word might take root in our lives, grow, flourish, and bear fruit for your kingdom. You told us that when the sun is lifted high, he will draw all men unto himself. We ask now that you be lifted high through the word of truth and that you would draw us close to yourself. We ask this in your son's name. Amen. Well, I want to confess to you that I'm coming today with what is the most obvious outline I have ever preached. But I think that is the magic of this text. Is that the truth is here in front of us in plain language for us to see with our eyes and hear with our ears. But then we get to wrestle with the implications of it. We get to dive into the depths that are communicated clearly in these two brief verses. So I have for you three points today. The first is this. Only God is able to keep you from stumbling. Only God is able to keep you from stumbling. Let me tell you, parenting is dangerous work. I you guys may be more sanctified than I am. I don't know. But I know that things that I thought had been put to, to death with my flesh, when I had kids, they came back with a vengeance. It's hard to parent. My son, Sam, who I, I told you a moment ago, we call Samity Calamity. He actually, we discovered this week, he thought that was, in fact, his full name. We're trying to correct that. Sam has this toy. It's great. It's Elmo, okay, but he does the Elmo slide. Any parents have this Elmo slide toy? It's wonderful. It's like my, parent, my kids have their own private aerobic dance instructor. You, you, you squeeze his hand, and he starts doing the Elmo slide back and forth, waving his arms the whole bit, telling the kids how to join in with him. And all of my children love it. And here's what inevitably happens. The kids all gather around Elmo, and they join him in the Elmo slide, but they all want to see who can be the closest to Elmo. And so this circle begins to get tighter and tighter around Elmo, and inevitably, Elmo gets knocked over. 
He gets knocked off his feet. And his feet are still going. His arms are still waving. He's still singing. The music's still going. But he's not doing the Elmo slide anymore because he's off his feet. Jude tells us here that only God is able to keep you from stumbling. Eugene Peterson translates that, that our God is able to keep you on your feet. To keep you on your feet. And I love that picture. Because the truth is our God keeps us on our feet in times of trouble. Now notice, he doesn't take you out of the circle of preschoolers aggressively doing the Elmo slide. Okay? He doesn't remove you from that situation. There will be trouble. Jesus guaranteed it in John 16. But he also guaranteed that he will be with us always. It's why we are able to truthfully say, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? For you are with me. See, this is the key. This is the key that he is with us in the trouble, like the fourth man in the fiery furnace. As you are in the heat of parenting, our Lord is alongside of you. He's keeping you on your feet. But he not only keeps, you, keeps us on our feet in times of trouble, he keeps us on our feet in times of despair. There are times that you look around and you think it is impossible. I'm not staying on my feet this time. You're looking around and everywhere you look, there's some preschooler doing the Elmo slide. You can't get away from those little people. But in all seriousness, there are times as a parent that hope is hard to find. And it comes in a variety of ways. More ways than we can recount this morning. Let me tell you, this is a hallmark of the people of God. Are you ready? When the situation is dire, God is at work. When the outlook is bleakest, God is moving. Now, if I'm going to tell you that this is a hallmark of the people of God, I feel that I need to present evidence. And so let's start from the beginning. The constitution of the people of God was achieved through whom? Abraham and Sarah. What do we know about them? Well, the book of Genesis tells us that the way of women had passed for Sarah and that they had no children. But when Abraham was 100 years old, he and his wife welcomed Isaac, their son. And from that son, the Lord made for himself a people a people that through all through that through the through his people all nations are blessed. Abraham and Sarah were in a dire situation and the Lord was at work. A couple of generations later, Joseph was left for dead in a pit by his brothers. And they sold him into slavery. Then in slavery he was falsely accused and thrown into an Egyptian prison where he was surely forgotten. But when things looked the worst, that God was working. And Joseph suddenly found himself at the right hand of Pharaoh, directing an initiative to literally save the world from famine. The Lord was at work. What about the Israelites a few generations later? As the Lord led them out of Egypt, they found themselves between an angry army of chariots and the water that they didn't know how to cross. And they cried out and they said, Moses, it would have been better if we just died in Egypt. But what does Moses say? He, said, he says, you need only to be still. The Lord will fight for you. And you know what happens. The waters part. The people walk across. And when Pharaoh and his army chased them in, the waters crashed down and the Lord vanquished the enemies of his people. A few, another few generations later, Joshua's leading the people into the land the Lord had promised to them. And their first person, the first opponent they came up against. How's this for a week one opponent, football fans? An impenetrable fortress called Jericho. People are probably thinking, okay, we, it was fun to imagine this while it lasted, but I think the journey of taking this land ends here, right? But it was not so because the Lord was at work. And they marched around 
They shouted and they blew trumpets. Basically what my kids do every day when they ought to be napping. And the walls came tumbling down. We could, I, I could do this all day, guys. But it's a hallmark of the people of God that when we have no reason to hope, God brings hope. Why? Because our hope is only found in Him. And so it is in parenting in those moments where hope is hard to find, in those moments when we despair, take heart. Christ has overcome the world. This means that no matter the outcome, our God sees us, He hears us, He walks beside us, and He promises He will restore us. We aren't promised a happy ending, but we are promised that in the end, all will be well. He keeps us on our feet in despair. But number two, we see that only God is able to present you blameless. Only God is able to present you blameless. Twice in my life, my wife and I have stood before a judge and promised to fulfill the duties of parenting the child that that judge was entrusting to us. It was two very different experiences. The first time we did this, we were in Ethiopia. Very jet lagged. I was wearing very wrinkled clothes because they'd been in a suitcase and I didn't have an iron. But I promised that judge that I would love and care for that child. And from that point forward, there was nothing that could make that child not my son. A few years later, we made the drive to Birmingham. And this time I was wearing a suit and a tie. A pressed suit and tie. <laughs> And we stood before a judge once again and we made the same promises. And that beautiful little girl was our daughter and there's nothing that can change that. Adoption is, is a, a beautiful, multifaceted, complicated thing. But, but I want you to hear that. I mention it today not because I want you to think, oh, that's neat. That's, that's a neat part of his story. But I want you to see that my story of adopting two children pales in comparison to what has taken place with our Heavenly Father. Because when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father, so you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. Elsewhere, Paul puts it like this. You, now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. This is what Jude is, is reminding us of here. Only God presents you blameless. Only God has taken a people that were far away from him and made them sons and daughters of the king. Shame is not in short supply in this world, and that is especially so in parenting. I might do 19 things right as a father in the day, but every night when I lay my head on the pillow, it's that 20th thing I did wrong that I can't stop thinking about. Are you with me there, parents, fathers? Even this week as I've prepared this message, I've heard the enemy in my ear. What in the world do you have to offer? You're the worst father in the room. Fathers, mothers, brothers, sisters, your God presents you blameless. He keeps you on your feet in trouble and despair. But in those moments when we take our eyes off of him and we see the wind and the waves and we begin to sink, there he is, his hand reaching down to pick us up, put us back on our feet. He doesn't just keep us from trouble. He erases the stain our obstinate, obstinate trouble leaves. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword or parenting? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, 
We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Fellow parents, fellow people in this room, our God presents us blameless with great joy. Shame does not have the final word. Our insecurities do not have the final word. The blood of the lamb who was slain before the foundation of the world has the final word. Third and finally, only God is worthy of glory, majesty, dominion, and authority. Only God is worthy of glory, majesty, dominion, and authority. I don't think that I could go in any church and say these things and find someone who who disagrees with them on on hand, right? These these are kind of base-level Christian beliefs right here. But the implications are profound. And I I just want to put three three implications from this in front of you today. This is by no means an exhaustive list, but just a list that I think is a good word for us today. Because only God is worthy of glory, majesty, dominion, and authority. That means that God is worthy of worship. God is worthy of worship. One of the great joys of parenting is passing things down to your kids. I'm curious. You can raise your hand for this, okay? Do any of you, do your kids play with toys that you played with as a child? You know, my son cared. I had this Chip and Dale, like the, the... uh, chipmunks, you know, the Disney chipmunks that I carried around as a kid and my son Theo carried him around. And a few weeks ago, actually this has been months ago now, I guess, but you know Mom's, the store in Seven Points downtown, kind of an antique store. There's a lot of stuff in it. Well, Theo had those with him that day. He put them down to ch- run around and look at something and he left them. A couple of weeks later, Maggie B sends me a picture from Mom's uh, stories on Instagram. And she says, hey, these are just like Chip and Dale that Theo had. Should I get them as a backup? I said, yeah, go get them. Well, we get them and we realize those were ours. Those were the ones I played with as a kid. They had distinct markings on them. He'd left them there. Just looked like merchandise, right? So they sold them back to us. Anyway, just funny story for you there. You pass the toys down. And what about clothes? Your kids ever wear clothes that you wore as a kid? Does that happen? Is that a thing? Yeah. Outfits you pass down. What about you? It's really fun and it's really easy to do this in the streaming area to sit down and watch shows and movies that you watched and enjoyed as a kid. I will say that I'm finding that the shows and movies I watched as a kid have a lot of language that I don't typically let my kids watch. The 90s were a wild time. What about teams? You raise your kids to to root for the right teams. You pass that down. I drag my kids to Braves games all the time. My my little kids will tell you about Ronald Cook Jr. They're real worried about his knee right now. What about places? You take them to places that were special to you. We went to kindergarten orientation for my daughter a, a couple of months ago. I'm not okay about it, but... We, uh, we, t- we went into my actual kindergarten room, and I was able to say, hey, even though there's probably been a half dozen or more teachers that weren't my teachers since then, but I said, hey, this is where I went to kindergarten. Maybe this will be your room. We love to pass those things. You maybe, maybe you pass your name down. I'm the fourth Clyde. I've, I've got that name passed down to me. There's also those things you pass down that you don't expect to or mean to. We were eating at Rosie's a few weeks ago, and you know, Rose is a wonderful place, if for no other reason than they bring you ice cream at the end. And, and we, were, we were sitting there eating, enjoying our ice cream, and our kids kept dropping ice cream in their lap, and we just couldn't figure it out. And so we were watching them, and they were turning their spoons upside down as they would bring it to their mouth. And we're like, what, what is this? And so then I started eating my ice cream, and my wife's like, you're doing it. It's you. And sure enough, I was taking the ice cream to my mouth and putting that spoon upside down, and my kids watched me do it. And I'd pass down this behavior to them without even meaning to. But brothers and sisters, the most important thing, the only essential thing that we pass down to our children is the faith that has been passed down to us. And we, we have to do it both ways, right? We have to do it on purpose where we're, we're intentionally setting out to show them 
the faith. We've also got to do it on accident so that they're just seeing us doing it and then they're turning those spoons upside down and doing it themselves. Let me put it to you this way. We, see, we tell our kids, taste and see that the Lord is good. But we also allow our kids to see us tasting God's goodness. And, you know, Jude says that he is worthy for all time and now and forever. You know, most of the things we pass down to our kids have a shelf life. For instance, what in the world are my kids going to do with all those beanie babies I accrued? Right? It means nothing to them. Just because it's valuable to me now doesn't mean it's going to be valuable to them in the future. But when we're passing down our faith, it is the only thing you're passing down to them. That is of the same value before all time and now and forever. So dads, really just parents in the room in general, are you teaching your children to pray? Are you teaching your children to study Scripture? You're teaching your children to sing. Dads, that's not an option. It's commanded of God's people in Scripture. We talk about hallmarks of God's people. God's people are a singing people. You're teaching your children to share their faith, to serve, to love one another. What about to prioritize church? That's not a negotiable either. The other side of all of those, are your children seeing you do those things? And I, I'm looking at myself in the mirror here, okay? I'm not standing up here pointing my finger at you without also pointing it at myself. Let me just briefly have an aside here, okay? Dads, for far too long, just generally speaking, we have been leaving this passing down of the faith to our wives to our children's mothers. Let me share something with you today. In the last 25 years, 15% of the U.S. adult population has stopped going to church, but just not coming back. It's not that they're irregular attenders. They're not attending at all. That is right at 40 million people. Put that number in perspective, because, you know, 40 million people, that doesn't mean anything. That is basically the number of people that were saved in the first great awakening, the second great awakening, and all the Billy Graham revivals combined. And in 25 years, they're just gone. Now, you, like me, may be thinking, well, it's all men. All the men are gone. That's not what the data shows. The data shows that this group is split basically evenly. 52% men, 48% women. So my point is this. Well, it's twofold. One, this trend will take an act of God to reverse. And we know that our God is able to do that. Okay? But it begins in our homes. We don't miss the handoff of the faith to our children or that number only gets worse. But the second thing is this. We had a get-out-of-jail-free card for a while, dads, where our wives were passing down the faith even when we weren't. But the data shows that get-out-of-jail-free card has expired. It's been spent. It's over. So let it be said of us that we are a people who worship our God, and that means that we're passing that faith down to our children, that they might pass it down to their children, and that this trend of de-churching might be reversed. The bottom line is this, we are teaching our kids to worship something. Is it the only thing worthy of their worship? So because he's worthy of worship, he's also worthy of obedience. If we worship him, we will obey him. When we come rolling up with our triple stroller, we get a lot of questions. You know, all the, all the kids were like the circus coming to town. You should have seen us at the Southern Baptist Convention this week. People would just stop and turn around in the middle of whatever they were doing, watch the parade go by. But the question we get most often is, hey, what was the hardest number change? And what they mean is like, was it hardest going from zero to one or one to two or two to three, so on and so forth? And my answer is always that it's hardest going from zero to one. 
And why is that? Because your whole reality changes. Nothing is the same after that. When we are in Christ, it is similarly a paradigm shift, even more so than adding a child to the mix, because we are literally a new person. The old is gone and the new has come. That means we do things differently. We spend our time differently. We spend our money differently. We evaluate success differently. And in parenting, that means we are more concerned than our kids. We have to ask ourselves, am I more concerned that my kids are keeping up with their peers or am I most concerned that my kids are being faithful to our God? You want your kids to be obedient? Well, you, then we have to set an obedient, an example of being obedient to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. God is worthy of our obedience. But finally, God is worthy of our trust. God is worthy of our trust. I consistently find that I'm most anxious as a parent when I feel like I have to do it all on my own. Let me, let me tell you a, a story here as, as we wrap up. You might have, if you were keeping score at home, you noticed I said that my daughter was five and my son was four. And they're about eight months apart. And that's some interesting math for you. So let me tell you how that works. In March of 2019, I was finishing up my first doctoral seminar at Midwestern. I was doing it remotely. And on a Friday morning, March the 8th, I guess it would be, March the 8th, 2019, I woke up that morning. I turned in all my work. It was finally done. And my wife took me to get ice cream to celebrate. And we went to St. Florine Pharmacy. Have you been out there? It's great ice cream, great environment. So we're sitting there eating ice cream and we were talking and my wife said, I, I just really am starting to suspect that I might be pregnant. I said, well, I, I can literally see the pregnancy test right there on the shelf as we're eating the ice cream. So let's just get one and see. So she takes the thing and we find out that she's pregnant. We're expecting a child and we're overjoyed. But just as we were overjoyed, we were also anxious because we were in the middle of an adoption process. We've been through two, we already had our son Maddox. He'd already been adopted and was in our home. But we'd, since Maddox's adoption, we'd had two failed international adoptions. In that time, we'd also had a miscarriage. We were in the middle of a domestic adoption process. We'd not, to our knowledge, been matched. But we knew we could do the math. We were getting close. So we're overjoyed for this life God has blessed us with. But what does that mean for our adoption process? Will we be put on hold? Will our agency drop us because of the change? Are we going to have to spend money updating a home study? This whole can of worms is open now. So that was on Friday. On Sunday was the Shoals Area Wide Prayer Rally. That year it was at Norton Auditorium. I was playing the piano. I was on the platform playing piano and no Floyd Kramer or Glenn Miller, don't worry. My wife was in the congregation. I was on the platform. And when we got home that night, we're debriefing. We both had prayed the same prayer. Lord, we don't know how to work this out, but we're trusting you. That was Sunday. And on Wednesday, my phone rings. 205 area code, which is where our agency was, still is. I pick it up and the, the voice on the other line says, hey, you have a little girl, come get her. And so Sophie came into our family in March. And then that baby from the positive pregnancy test, Theo, comes along in uh, November of that same year, 2019. I tell that story this morning not to hold myself up and say, hey, look how much I trusted God. But I tell this story because I need to be reminded of the ways God has shown himself to be worthy of my trust in the past. Right? These stories from the past of God providing, of God making a way, are ammunition, evidence for us to stand on as we continue to trust him today. And this is a biblical practice. Go read the Psalms. They tell stories over and over and over of God's faithfulness so that they are inspiring faithfulness today. Yesterday's faithfulness inspires today's, or I'm sorry, yesterday's trust inspires today's trust. God's faithfulness in the past feeds our trust in him today. We don't only need, though, to tell our stories of God's faithfulness to ourselves, but we need to tell them to each other. I told you that story today because my hope is that you'll see, hey, God was faithful to him. I can trust him. I, 
I, I, I'm not creative enough to have hoped for that story to play out the way that I thought that it did. I like to think of myself as a creative person. I, I couldn't have drawn that one up. Even as I was praying for God to work it out, I'm thinking, God, just like begin to work in the heart of our social worker that they'll kind of look the other way and let all this work out, right? Like, I had no way of thinking that my daughter had already been born, that I was going to meet her in just a few days. Only God does that. And we trust him because he is better at this than we are. The author of life is the author of your story, and he's a better writer than you. Trust him. Let him write. So brothers and sisters, in closing today, we have three opportunities in front of us. First is this, become a son or daughter of God. Right? I told you, he, has made, he, he wants to present you blameless. He sent his son to die to pay the penalty for your sin. And three days later, he walked out of that grave so that we can forever be with him. That hand is reaching out today. Take it, hold it. Parents in the room, it's time to parent like a son or daughter of God. Let that be the thing that our kids remember most about us. Let that be the thing that we give to our kids that they give to their kids that they did give to their kids. If you're not a parent in the room, then the opportunity is the same. Live like a son or daughter of God. God is presenting himself to the world and for reasons that I can never explain, he's doing it through his church, through his people. Let's be a part of that story that he is writing.